morning and welcome to the Roundtable here on Go Union Radio 106.9 FM, the heartbeat of dialogue. Today on the program, we are looking at achieving world peace through dialogue, good governance and friendship. And I would like to add through ethics to that. Today we are uh, talking with someone who understands this and is widely traveled. He is a professor of ethics and intercultural relations and the director of GlobeEthics.net in Geneva, Switzerland. Matter of fact, he joins me via Skype from Geneva, Switzerland. Good morning to you, uh, Monsignor. Alex, my pleasure. Good morning from Globe Ethics in Geneva. Yes, uh, it's, uh, I'm elated actually that we're having this conversation. Uh, well, I'll start by asking you uh, what is ethics and what the role of ethics is in go governance and corporate world. Uh, this is a topic of very vast significance. Ethics is a language and a word that is universally applicable. It refers to the art, manner, and process of doing the right thing, the right time, the right place, and based not simply on morality, but much more on what we might call principled, rational decisions. So put simply, ethics is the art of serving society, serving the human community, serving the global concerns by being rationally, reasonably decisive in doing the good. Mm. So thank you so much for that. And let, let, let's take a look at intercultural dialogue. Have we embraced it as a way of fostering peace among many races of the world? Well, we have had several cases of intercultural confusion and conflicts. We have made cultures to be barriers amongst peoples. We have forced ourselves into limiting the boundaries of human understanding in many cultures and countries and epochs in the past. What is important is that intercultural dialogue enters what you might call the plenary, the stage, center stage of human interactivity to prove that there can really be a complementation of people around cultures, across languages and religions and races. We have much more to learn from each other and much more to give to each other than fighting each other. So what ethics does an intercultural dialogue, which is part of what GlobeEthics.net in Geneva promotes, is to ensure that we allow a tolerant and free engagement of people, of cultures, of voices around the world, irrespective of where they come from, to build global peace and harmony, to learn from each other, to complement each other, and to respect that which is even beyond our own comprehension, in the sense that the world is not limited only to me or my boundaries. The world is a globe that is past, present, and future. Wars have been held in the past because of lack of understanding that we are really different and yet complement each other. World peace can only be guaranteed if global dialogue on intercultural, interreligious, interhuman, intergenerational levels are carried out. And Globe Ethics tries to make this possible as we are going now to do in the first week of June here in Geneva, bringing people from all the continents of the world to discuss the management and teaching of ethics in higher education, including Godfrey Okoye University. I'm very happy and proud to announce that from Godfrey Okoye University, we have already received names of those who will be attending, including your Vice Chancellor, Professor Anieke, and your Ethics Director of the University, alongside others from all the world, to showcase 
how integrating ethics can promote a university, the students, the youth, like um, your own university, our own university, God for Care, tries to do. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, you, you raised issues about uh, wars, but sometimes we've noticed that wars actually are not fought because, because th there is an absence of good governance. Sometimes wars have been fought because of other issues other than politics. What are those issues that interfere with good governance, as it were? Because uh, some people will, will argue and say that Good governance is something relative. It's not something that can be achieved. But what are those obstacles in the way of accomplishing good governance? I may have to contradict you, um, uh, Alex. Um, the wars are caused because of the absence of good governance. When there is a diet of leadership, because it is leadership that incorporates governance, it is leadership that brings out vision, mission, values, and an agenda for implementation. So if the political, social, economic, and otherwise leaders, business leaders, captains of industry, are not able to act ethically, they create a space for confusion, for conflicts, and for wars. Wars are not just fought overnight. Wars emerge because there has been a long history of gaps of gaps that are based on corruption, on suppression, on injustice, on neglect, on lack of access, and on complaints that have not been listened to. So wars eventually lead to misunderstandings which, on the bottom line, the absence of good leadership, the absence of good governance, remain the reasons. Take any war fought anywhere. Is the First World War, is the Second World War, are regional wars. They are fought because there is a debt, a lack of leadership, of good leadership, of corporate governance, of political governance, of religious governance, of cultural and otherwise levels um, where we expect reasonable leadership from those who take charge of human beings and their affairs. I will therefore think that training the leaders of the future, the youth especially, who will become bankers, who will become presidents, who will become teachers, who will become parents of children, who will become professors, who will become politicians, training these youth by imbibing in them, integrating in them, rational levels of behavior. That is, that one decides that it is wrong to offend another. It is wrong to plagiarize. It is, it is not integrity to take or steal what belongs to another. It is better to act in respect and with tolerance than to act without respect towards others. I must be in a position to respect the environment and treat trees and water and others and things in nature as things that must be protected. Sustainability therefore comes into this picture. So what Globe Ethics tries to do is to build up in the Committee of Nations the world of the future by building upon the youth as a strategic um, uh, um, a point of departure. And with having done this, you will discover that wars, therefore, become unnecessary because after every war, people still go back to the table to discuss peace. So why did you need to go to war in the first place? Wars have never been seen to solve any problem. For all those problems for which humanity went for wars, they still eventually came back, even after the wars, to dialogue on how they will live together and move forward. So what we try to do, and what I think is very important, therefore, is to ensure that wars are, don't even happen. And that ensurance that wars don't even happen is based primarily and mainly on good governance, which means leadership, vision, ethical values, and strong character, which we call integrity. If leaders act with integrity and respect, there will be no wars. But we need it not only for one country, we need it for other countries. Because if one leader is acting respectably and others are not, then you have already a potential point of conflict, which can even lead to war. 
but one must have so much restraint and patience to temper the use of force, which implies killing human beings. We can never bring them back to life again. Mm. All right, thank you so much, uh, Monsignor. Uh, let's look, let's take a look at uh, something that still speaks on governance. Uh, what do we need in Africa, matter of fact? Is it strong institutions or strong men or both? Um, you will recall the speech by Barack Obama, who spoke that Africa needs strong institutions. He made this statement in Ghana, and um, not just strong men. But actually, who makes up institutions? They are made up by human beings. Institutions are not buildings. Institutions are the legal, the judiciary, the political class, the economic class, the offices of government, the various levels of um, collaborations which make a country work, whether it's its accounting policies, the laws that they make, and all these are operated by human beings. So we must move, first of all, from the point of view of building ethical human beings. We don't use the word strong individuals or strong, powerful leaders. No. We use the word ethically oriented, value-oriented human beings. It is these value-oriented human beings who have principles for their lives. Then they go and work in institutions. They work in the judiciary. They work in police. They work as politicians. They work as leaders of teachers in classes. When human beings are qualified as persons, so we must talk about the integrity of the human person first. When human beings are qualified as persons, they will then be in a position to run institutions. We don't use to oppose them and say, it's either you have good individuals or good. You must need both. The institutions don't run themselves. So what we need in Africa, first of all, are well-articulated, clearly trained, ethically-oriented, visionary people who are willing, with selflessness, with determination, to serve their people. So it comes back again squarely on leadership. The second, of course, you need such leadership to be organized. And you need education for the society. You need to train people. If you say go and vote, and people do not know what to vote for because they are just thinking about their immediate policies. If you have a country or countries where 60%, a majority do not go to school, do not know the priorities of nation building, do not have the potentials, let me say, to choose between A and B, then you already have these things, um, the problems um, stated because such a leadership can abuse its people. So you need a trained citizenry, and you need an alert leadership. And it is from the citizenry that the leadership comes from. We must put every energy in training our women, in training our men, not only in one continent, but universally. And in training them towards an orientation that makes them look not just upon themselves as the end, but upon others as beings to serve. We must also look at the matters, because you speak about a continent like Africa, the matters that concern collaboration with others, because no country exists alone. We live in interdependence. We must move from independence to interdependence in a global environment. It is this global environment that challenges, and that's where you come with your values, others come with theirs, and we enter the theater for intercultural dialogue and um, try to learn. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. So we need to learn from the experiences of others and to share these experiences and contextualize them and adapt them within our own areas so that we can move forward. What I see every time and everywhere is the fact that we drive a car with reverse gear. If you want to move a car, you enter gear one, two, and three, and four. But we drive a car with reverse gear because we don't build on the experiences of the past. And this, is, this has now to do with post-colonial Africa. We have governments that don't build upon the advantages of the past governments before them. We create gaps between past and present, between present and future. Corruption, of course, enters into the theater. The management of resources becomes an issue. 
and you can count the problems one after another. And then, of course, manipulations come, tribalism, racism, lack of understanding, and the various things of the rich versus the poor, and the degeneration that eventually lead to conflicts. So Africa needs education, an education founded on ethical principles and values, an education that produces future leaders that are responsible. And these responsible leaders then run the show by building the resources of its own people, human resources, natural resources, environmental resources, into a sustainable lifestyle. Then you talk about the sustainable development goals. And these goals must be imbibed not as thesis, but as life. Globe Ethics tries to promote these values. Thank you so much, uh, Monsignor. Uh, formal education aside, whose duty is it to train the leaders? We want to have leaders who are ethical. Who prepares someone to be maybe a governor, a senator, a house of assembly member? Where do you learn it? Uh, putting aside the fact that you need to go to school, maybe get a degree, who trains you to become a leader? Um, this question is very important, but you know that education is never ended. You keep on learning all through life. So you start learning when you are born into an environment, into a family, into a context, into a nation, which, we, which means nationality, nation, natus from Latin, where you are born. Those who have blood relationships from you, you look at a child in an African village, it is trained by everybody around, the aunts, the uncles. They tell the child the boundaries of to do and not to do, and they give it and accompany the child. So that being responsible as elders in accompanying young children who grow around us, whether we are parents or relations, this is important. So the era of I don't care, it does not concern me, is already building on bad leaders for the future. For an adult to pass and to see a child do a wrong thing and not to give the child a good advice that will help it to grow is already not to add value to preparing the future. But besides this level, you have the schools where you have teachers. Today we need teachers who just don't give the formal education, but who also are mentors. A teacher is one whose lifestyle teaches more than the words. And that's what Globe Ethics try to do when you are punctual to class, when you don't plagiarize, when you as a teacher do not harass, the vic make victims of your students, when you as a teacher work hard and teach them the values of hard work, when you guide according to the principles of, um, of learning that is beyond just the classroom work. But that is now the formal education and then what comes with it. But it's not just about knowledge, it's also about character. Then you move beyond it. We have institutions within society, whether they are the religious, the cultural, the political, the non-governmental, and the various forms of institutions that engage human beings. If you take, for example, what the Christian churches do, daily and Sundays, people go there. Future leaders emerge from those who go now to share the perspectives of religion, like for the Christians or for the Muslims, the Hindus or the Buddhists and others, or African traditional religions, they learn about the ways of their ancestors and how being good and knowing that one day you will be judged. So it is really the, the stubbornness of human beings if you go, for example, to these religions and you learn nothing, you come back and become still a very bad person. But even we move beyond there to see now how does a senator learn how to be a senator. Now, Nigeria has a constitution. We must make the teaching of the Constitution part of the curriculum that you offer to children in schools. You must make patriotism part of the teachings you offer to children in schools. You must make the national oath and all those things that build up a nation part of the things. You just don't teach them biology and English and geography and history. It's not enough. Citizenship education, ethical education, character education must become formalized and be part of the curriculum of studies in every country. Because that is where now you train people to respect, to guide, to lead, 
and to grow. When I become a senator, I don't pluck senatorship from the air. It's all the things I've already grown up with, from youth into adulthood. So there is a school, and that school begins from the day one is born. It is not a school one attends for only one day or two days. Stubborn people, wicked human beings, and so on, they just don't fall from the sky. It is part of what, and there's nobody who is so bad that you cannot change that person. And there's nobody who is so good that you can't influence this person to get bad. So it's a matter of what values and what character and personality do we in the era, in the environment of education, bring around the table that people grow to become solid. When you take examples of what we try to do at Globe Ethics, or you take example of what happens at Godfrey Okoye University, where you are and from where you are interviewing from the radio house, you will discover that the environment of Godfrey Okoye University is comparatively very, very high because the models, the teachers, the vice chancellor, his board, the board of trustees, and the ownership of the university are engaged and interested in making this place work. They look at it as, like, as, as, a, as a mission and as a work in progress to ensure that the future youth come out to be self-reliant, to be respectable, and to be citizens that can lead others. Education happens all through life. It does not stop. But it starts somewhere from birth. Education is from cradle to grave. Yeah. Uh, Monsignor, I would like to ask this one. Uh, the, the saying that it takes a village to raise a child is that it has been cited internationally too. I hear people cite it in America and even in Europe. But then, uh, there's also the Ubuntu uh, concept in South Africa. Where did we miss the point, especially from this part of the world, about uh, taking responsibility for any child other than our own child? If I am a father, every child around me is my child. So what's the problem that nowadays people run into a situation they should help someone? They would rather settle to take pictures with their phones and put on social media instead of taking responsibility for accident victims, for people who are getting into a fight, or people who are in need. They decide to take a photo to put on social media instead of being a human being that is created to feel something when they run into such situations. I'm surprised, Alex, that you mentioned that in the US and in Europe, people use the adage, a village is needed to train a child. I've never had it in Europe. It's only Africans and Asians who say that kind of thing. Europeans have grown to become individualistic. You mind your own business. The famous adage in the United States is, everyone to oneself, God for us all. That is the, an adage that has been bro spread by the Republican Party for a long time. So it is not the West that has the wisdom which we talk about. You have to look at Africa as the continent that has this wisdom that has come from centuries of also experience. First of all, an agricultural economy is different from a technologically and digital economy. The technological progress the world has made so far has made people to be individualistic. The more technological a society is, the more danger its industrialization can pull it away from being human. These days we read books and we hear people talk about the, the post, I can hear you. Are you there? I can hear you. I can hear you very clearly. You can hear me? Yes. Hello, Prof. Can yes, you hear me? I can hear you and I would like to bring the topic to an end. I was talking about um, okay, a, a village to train a child. It is Africa and the African continent that makes this philosophy a way of life. When you hear about Ubuntu, which is a word in South Africa, Ubuntu, Ugabuntu, Ngamuntu. Okay? It, you need to be a human being with other human beings in the context of being human. But we have it also in Umunna, and Umunne, and Umuada, and the Ibokweno philosophy, which you find in southeastern Nigeria. The Ibokweno, or the Umunna, or the Umunne, 
or Onyang and Awanneya philosophy is something that is universal. This Onyang and Awanneya and Yokoma Million or Bao Fufu, this is something that builds on solidarity. You have it also probably in communist countries, but that is more of uniformity and communism, which is an ideology than of a lifestyle that is founded on wisdom. But I do agree, and I've always said it, that you need to move from a post-human society and come back to a normal human society. Industrialization is good. The digital era is wonderful, is very useful. But the human person must colonize and manage these tools. You mentioned social media. Yes, people will take social media of somebody who is wounded in an emergency than helping the person clearly. However, I'm wondering whether anything is new in human societies because I read the Bible and when I glance into Luke's gospel, I find the story of the Good Samaritan where one man was lying on the road and people were looking at their watch and passing by until a Samaritan came and took care of the person who was in need. Would Jesus use an example to say, we have to be human, we have to be merciful, we have to be compassionate, we have to engage. Every generation has its own challenges. So the questions we ask at this time are not necessarily new, but they assume new forms. But they are not new. The question of human beings' interrelationship, training the next generation. So I do feel that the African philosophy needs a scale-up and a voice. And some of us who walk around this topic, that's why I teach intercultural um, uh, um, studies, we try to bring in the African voice into the universal voice to ensure that at least some of those good qualities we have can also remain and be taught in an intergenerational manner to the next generation. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, this is the Roundtable on Going to Radio 106.9 FM. This program is interactive and we are live. I'm talking with my senior professor, Obi Orike. He is a professor of ethics and intercultural relations and the director of globeethics.net in Geneva, Switzerland, from where he is talking to me via Skype. And you can talk to us from your home by... Uh, calling the program. All right, uh, Rebecca, let's allow him to respond to the question. Uh, Prof, he's asking. I, I, I think I, I caught his question. What are we? What is Globe Ethics doing to to reach to the yeah people, especially around here, to understand and rediscover themselves? I can tell you very clearly. Um, Globe Ethics engages teachers who train people. And this is a very key area for activity and scaling it up. If at Globe Ethics we are able to have a roundtable of teachers who are trained and certified, it is these teachers who, when they leave institutions of higher learning, they train young children in nursery schools, in secondary schools, in universities. And this is an impact where we fail because dealing with each individual is so difficult in a world of 7 billion people. But if you will go to the institutions of higher education and train those who will become future teachers to engage their clients, their students, their children, their families in an ethical manner, this is one area where Globe Ethics is already active. And last year, two years ago, and this year, Globe Ethics will be very active in Nigeria. In October, the board of Globe Ethics will be having a big conference in Lagos, at the Lagos Business School, engaging people from across Nigeria, government, academia, business schools, and the so youth from the, um, the LEAP Foundation run by um, Mrs. Ndidi Muneli, for example. Now, in November this year, Globe Ethics will be at Godfrey Okoye University to do a training program that will engage Enugu State University of Science and Technology, Godfrey Okoye University, IMT, Institute of Management and Technology, Peaceland College, and the University of Nigeria and Sukkah, around many others who will want to join. It's, the call is already being made. Two years ago, Globe Ethics was at the UNN and brought together people from African countries, from Kenya, from Uganda, Burkina Faso, Sudan, all to Nigeria, around the topics which we are discussing. 
So I would like to thank Nemeka for listening to this program and for asking this question. To know also that even in June this year, Globetis will be bringing vice chancellors from around the world to come to Geneva and to see how they, as teachers, with their colleagues, will impact and carry back the values they learn to their institutions to make sure that our world is a better place. So there is something we do. Globe Ethics is also writing books. I mean, I'll be very um, interested for Nemeka to take note of www.globeethics.net to visit our website and to engage in, in uh, over 4 million documents, that 4 million on any topic that deal with things one can read as poetry, as literature, as scientific, bioethics, economic ethics, political ethics, and so on, on our publications. And also to be part of what Globe Ethics tries to do in terms of competitions, essay competitions for young people, and um, uh, drama, and we are now coming out with an, 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 an app, an application that will help people to engage even in games, because these are all areas where young people learn. And then we are developing products, including um, uh, something to do with curriculum, which will be used by teachers to teach their students and to engage in certification programs. So there is a lot happening, and this um, activity needs a lot of collaboration of people like you, of Nemeka, of the press, of the media, of the political class, of policymakers, of those who are engaged in seeing that this world is a better place, so that we can really move forward. Hmm. Well, thank you, Prof. Uh, we are also expecting more calls, 081-8888-1069, or 081-7777-1069. There is a call up on the line. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. What's your name and location? Alex, my name is Kofi Yama. Kofi Yama. <coughs> Let's have your question. My very regards to both my, my line of your case. Um, I, I want to know what is the contribution of uh, Globetic to coming down uh, peace in Syria because I think that's the following point now in the, in the, in the, in, in the world. So what is Globetic doing to make sure that there's a dream? I think I had him. I had Kofi Annan very clearly. Kofi, I'm greeting you. Good morning from here. And um, I will only want to tell you that Syria is not in one place. Syria is in many places in Africa. Syria is in many parts of Latin America and Asia. Syria is quite well known as a country in the Middle East, but we have many Syrias burning all around the place. And these are the, the wars we are talking about. So when you mention the Syria that is located in the Middle East as a very burning point, just think a little bit, um, Kofi, on what's happening in uh, Korea, North and South. Think about what's happening in Somalia. Go a little bit to Libya. Go to Colombia. Think about the drug laws and the drug wars in Mexico. Think about what's happening in the United States itself. The gunning downs and daily shootings by young people of their own classmates and teachers. Think about the Fulani headsmen in Nigeria, which has now become almost like a horrific um, story to even think of, talk less of retail, because it looks like a harangue over the entire country. So it is not just about Syria, where you have the big players, the United States and the West, and then of course the Eastern Bloc, like were led by Russia, and to some extent, you know, moving around and trying to showcase power. We are thinking about what's happening globally. So Syria globalized. And then the bottom line is, what is the ethics of weapon industry? Who produces the chemical bombs? Who produces the atomic bombs? Who produces the nuclear bombs? Who makes the biological weapons? Who produces, are we living an economy that grows weapons? Do we need bread or do we need weapons? It's an ethical question. 
And on this, Globe Ethics has done a lot of work in terms of trying to think that disarmament is the right way to go for the world. Because if there are no arms, there will be no user. But if you make knives and leave children there, they will definitely use it. So that's one point of departure. The other one is the consequences of political engagement and the lack of access, economy. People fight when they are hungry and they fight when they have eaten too much. So what do we do about ensuring justice in the world? Because the reason for um, wars is often called injustice. And peace is where there is justice. Peace is where people respect each other, tolerate each other, and give to each other what is their due. People fight when what is their due seems to have been taken away. So I want to thank you, Kofi, for making this point. But I just want to let you know that the drama of Syria is not just a Syria in one place. It's a Syria in many, many places. Think about Myanmar. Think about what's happening in former Burma. Go to India. Think about Pakistan and Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, think about the war in Yemen with Saudi Arabia playing a very big role. So we do need to globalize ethics, to globalize values, to globalize solidarity, to globalize disarmament, and to globalize peace building so that there is not just one Syria where the United Nations is making its own resolutions, but there is a world, and the reason for the United Nations is to build world peace and assure security and prevent any wars happening among nations. That's why the heads of states come together to say, instead of our fighting, let's dialogue and diplomize about it. If people must go to war to make peace, there is nobody there alive to make peace because all die in a war. We must be reasonable and responsible enough to know that at this time and age, humanity has produced weapons of mass destruction that needs nobody alive. So disarmament is the name of the game. I would like to inform you that the Holy Father, Pope Francis, will be coming to Geneva on 21st June 2018. And he was coming to Geneva to where my office is here at Globe Ethics, where the World Council of Churches has also its headquarters. And Pope Francis will be making a very strong statement in our offices. I will be there present. I hope you will hook up to look at it live from where you are. Uh, I'm sure definitely Alex will be watching us on that day. Kofi Annan be awake and alive to see, the, to listen to the statement which the Holy Father, Pope Francis, is going to deliver at that kind of occasion. We are here at Globe Ethics. We are also making input to ensure that the voices of good are more than the voices of war and evil. Thank you so much, uh, Monsignor. As we wrap up now, uh, let's actually just get a feel of Let's come home and talk about the awareness people have in terms of what to do. Uh, leadership, because it's in, being a, it's in being a good follower that you'll naturally be a good leader. What's your take on that as we wrap up? If I follow a bad leader, I will be led into darkness. So it's not just about followership, it's about me, myself, being a leader. Each person can be a leader. And that is why ethics is not for the leader and the others are not. There is need for each human being to be a champion wherever you are. So what we are dealing with is to ensure and integrate a value-oriented life in each human person. It's very difficult, but it's an agenda that must be tried. It was tried by the great... Um, um, uh, great personalities in the past in history, and we also try during this period. How do you make out of each person autonomous individual able to decide what is right and wrong at each stage, and not waiting even to be told to do what is right or what is wrong, but to be in a position to do it myself? This is where corruption, if you say the leader is corrupt, therefore I will be, no, I don't need to follow a corrupt leader. So it's not about the followers following the leader. No, that will be self-sheepish. It will be about me being a leader to follow also my conscience at certain times and to be in a position to do what is right anytime, anywhere. Of course, we do know how difficult it is if your leader is corrupt, wants you to be corrupt. 
if your leader is um, uh, you are poor, wants you to be dependent so that he will make you rich if you obey the rules. And like those who hire kidnappers, said, told them, go and do the wrong things. People must be in a position to say, I stand for something. And I'm willing to die for what I stand for. This is called principled existence. But when you live for nothing and you die for nothing, then it was not worth living at all. There is a time in life when people must say, we stand for something. And ethics is that point where here at Globe Ethics we feel that we must continue to train human beings around the globe through religious institutions, through educational institutions, through political institutions to do the good. See the difficulty though. Hello, Prof. I can hear you. Yes, to do the good. People must be groomed to do that which is right. And um, uh, it will not therefore be just follow your leader. But you be a leader. You shine as a light wherever you are. So if I'm a classroom teacher, I'm the light. If I'm a driver of a taxi, I'm the light. If I'm a student, I'm the best. So be the best of what you are anywhere. Mm. All right. We have to leave it there. Monsignor Professor Ubiorike, uh, Professor of Ethics and Intercultural Relations and the Director of Global Ethics at Geneva, Switzerland. Thanks for your time and thoughts on the roundtable this morning all the way from Geneva at the globethics.net. Thanks a lot, Prof. Thank you very much, Alex, and God bless you.